I think one of the people who said it best was Jada Pinkett Smith when she talked about her father on the Red Table Talk. And she said, he wasn't created solely to be my father. Like he was created as an individual for an individual purpose. And, you know, he just so just so happened along his path that he became her father. And, you know, but was there a manual with that? Did he know how to do that? Was that what he was created for? No. (laughs) And so when I look at that and I apply it to my own parents, it's like they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know what they were carrying. They didn't know what several call generational curses or, you know, cycles that were on both sides of their families, they didn't know how it affected them. And so then as a result, they didn't know how it affected me and how it impacted them raising me. I'm Summer. And I'm Mike. And we got married with children. It's been 12 years since we got this gang together. And we're still running the rapids of living with a blended family. And sometimes that is just not easy. If you're looking for support and tools when it comes to divorce, step parenting, co parenting, and giving it your best, you're in the right place. We're talking about everything. You ready to get this party started? Always. She's a motivational speaker and the host of an amazing podcast called The Shift. I invited Jay Camille to come on the show today because her story is one that I think teens of divorced parents and divorced parents should hear. Her takeaways from growing up with divorced parents will shed so much insight on what children go through, how they feel about it as they grow up, and even more powerful are the insights and perspectives she has now as an adult. She is beautiful in every way, and I am so excited to share this interview with you. But just before we go to the interview, I wanted to share another anonymous letter from one of our listeners. If this is your first time listening, let me tell you quickly what this anonymous letter form is. We created a way that you can anonymously submit that letter you've always wanted to write, but never send. I'm loving how all of you are using this and we're getting really awesome letters. Some of you write a letter to Mike and I and and just have some comments or questions, which we super love. And some of you use it to write that letter you've always wanted to send to an ex or to your parents or your in-laws or maybe even your kids. The idea is to write out the things that you are harboring and get it off your chest. And then we read them here on the podcast so that it's out there in the world. But the thing is, is that it is anonymous. We don't even know who you are. So when we receive the submission, it just says that there has been a submission. We don't see the email it came from. There's no IP address to track it. There's nothing attached to it. So we have no idea who you are unless when we respond to say, thank you for your submission, you actually reply back, which a lot of you don't seem to do, which is totally fine. We just love getting these submissions and we get it. It's anonymous. That's the purpose. So we won't share it even if you do reply and we find out who you are we're not going to share who you are. But this is your chance to really say the thing that you want to say to someone, whether it's good, bad, whatever that is, you get to say it anonymously. So if you want to do that yourself, you can check it out at everythingalways.co forward slash forum. So here is that letter and it's actually super appropriate. So I picked this one, especially for today's discussion. I've listened to so many of your podcasts, and I tend to appreciate the ones that come from people who grew up with divorced parents. I don't have any children of my own, but I'm dating someone with kids. I have compassion for his kids because I know how I felt growing up in a divorced home. I don't believe my parents did a good job. I felt like I was bouncing a bouncing ball between the two of them. I've considered telling them how horrible I felt growing up, but chicken out every time. I'm sad that you guys put yourselves first over me. It was more important to you to one-up each other or get in the last word than it was to care about how it all made me feel. I have a lot of anger because of this. And at times I lose it with my boyfriend because I don't see him do the same things with his baby mama. Oh, sorry, because I see him do the same things with his baby mama. I love my parents and I don't want to hurt their feelings. It's been so many years, but I would want them to know that I feel a big part of my childhood was stolen because of the way they handled their divorce. I hope someone listening will hear this and put their kids' feelings first. 
I so appreciate that. You wrote this and I can see you addressing addressing your parents and then addressing how you feel, which is awesome. And we super appreciate that. And I think that today's interview, if you're listening to this and you just heard your letter read, today's interview is, uh, I think will be very valuable to you. So we're going to talk about a lot of really great things today. And Jay Camille is, is really amazing. And again, I said this earlier, but I think it's something really useful for, for kids to hear, especially teenagers that are a little bit older. And if you are somebody like, like our listener here who wrote in, who is a child of, who, who grew up in a divorced home, I think you'll get some, some really good insights out of this. All right. Now to the interview. Hello, Jake Neal. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited that you're joining me today. Uh, we've got some pretty important things to discuss, and I know you're going to share so much value to our listeners. So welcome. Yes. Thank you, Summer, for having me on. As she said, my name is Jay Camille. I'm the host of the Shift podcast, and I'm happy to be here today. Well, I'm so excited to connect with you. Before we get into all of the juicy good stuff that you're going to share, can you give a little bit of a a background on what you do, what the shift is about, and how you got into this and why it became the thing that you do? Yes, absolutely. And I'm really excited because it goes in hand with the the topic today. So the shift is about the major pivotal moments that we face in life. So transitions such as adjusting from college to career or high school to college, or even relationships, singleness to marriage and vice versa. And I realized in my opinion, I consider myself a master of shifts, though I'm not perfect, but I learned how to master them after undergoing my parents' divorce when I was a child. And so that was like a very major shift in my life. And then I also lived in a military town. So having to experience your friends being in and out, I learned to just adjust to the shift and quickly learn how to pivot and transition. And I realized most people don't know how to do that. Or if they have to do it, it's usually something traumatic or bad. And I'm like, no, we can make this positive. There's always some light in the tunnel that you can find. So that is what inspired me to make the shift. And then I'm really excited because it's what we're going to be talking about today. Yes, absolutely. It's interesting because I did not go through a divorce as a child. I didn't, I don't know what it's like to have divorced parents, but here, here I am, you know, raising my own two two children after having gone through divorce and then also helping to raise my husband's children who have been through divorce. Now we've got four kids who have gone through it, you know, and it's, it's a different thing to, to go, wow, to put yourself in, in their shoes. It's, it's tough, but well, I'd love to talk about, you know, what, what are some of the things that, what age were you first of all? And what, what was like your first discovery or truth that you learned? So I was actually three when it happened. But Mm -hmm. it was, I knew it was happening because we moved towns. And so like I'm initially from St. Louis, Missouri, and then I ended up growing up in a military town in Oklahoma. That's about nine hours away. So as we were moving, I'm like, okay, wait, what's going on? We're packing up all of our stuff. Me, mom, and my sister are going, but dad's staying. Is he coming to join us later? You know, all of those different thoughts. And that's when I realized, okay, something is happening. And then when I found out the root of the divorce and what actually happened, I was about seven. And it was very interesting. Like it it wasn't told to me by either of my parents. It was told to me by the person that my dad was dating at the time. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) And so then like (laughs) once it was told to me and then she didn't even like directly tell me, but I, I was smart enough and young enough to be able to put two and two together. And so then I just kind of sat there shocked and I'm like, I don't know what to say. I don't know who to talk to. It took me two years to talk to my mom about it. And I, the, the first person I did talk to is my grandmother and my grandmother, she was kind of like, I can't confirm or deny, but I'll tell you, you just need to talk to your parents. And so I held that in for two years 
to talk to my mom and she validated it. And I talked to my dad and he did not. He was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know where you got it from. And I'm like, I got it from your girlfriend. What are you talking about? (laughs) So it was, it was definitely a lot to take in at a young age. And especially when you have one parent that's saying, yes, that's what happened. And another parent that's saying no. And then it, it makes you more confused on what really happened and who can I really trust? So it just, it created a lot of problems going on into my upbringing and now even my adulthood. And that's that seven years old when that's a, that's a hard, that's, well, any age you, you need to feel that security, but you're starting to become aware of a lot of other things, you know, in, in the world at seven. So that's yeah. a lot to, to take in. What, that's how do you, what do you wish if you could go back? Like, how do you wish that would have happened? I honestly, and I've had this conversation a lot with different people as well as with both of my parents. I just wish there would have been a sit down conversation of the truth. And maybe when I was young, like three, I'm sure they probably wouldn't have been able to fully explain mommy and daddy are going our separate ways. But probably once I did hit seven or eight, and I was able to understand a little bit more, I wish that there would have been a sit down conversation of this is the truth of what happened on both sides, even if it's ugly. And even if, you know, neither person wanted to talk about it, it would have helped me. Um, And I also think it would have helped my relationship with each set of parents, because then I wouldn't have resented one parent over the other, because you know, one parent is saying, yes, this is what happened. And one parent is saying no. And so then the parent that's saying no, I started to resent them because of what happened. And I I just wish there would have been a foundation of truth. I think oftentimes parents think that kids, they, they like, they want to hide their kids from the truth and they think that it protects them, but it actually can hinder them. And even though Externally, it's protecting them. Internally, it's making them question. It's making them do a lot of deep searching and oftentimes making them lost. And so I just, I feel like a foundation of truth is always the best place to start. And I I had a relative who's actually going through a divorce right now. And he came to me and talked to me because he knew how I felt about it. And I said, he needs to talk to his daughter. And I was like, you guys need to talk to her both as parents. And they did. And they sat down and did it. And I even think that they're looking into therapy for her, which is an even greater step. I wish my parents would have done, but at least sitting down and having the conversation. And I think that would have made everything much better. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting. My brain is spinning because we've, we've always said like, don't, don't bad mouth the other parent. And, you know, it's the reasons that you got divorced is, is none of their business. Maybe you can talk about it when you're older, but I'm having, as I'm listening to you, I'm like, well, if you two come together and you agree on, like, as you say, this foundation of truth, and you know you're explaining to the children like hey here's what happened i mean again at the emotional maturity level that they can handle certain things because every divorce situation is different but you do have this like well i can trust them and they're being honest to me and and nobody's like hitting one parent against the other instead it's like here's what happened but we're going to work together to be the best parents we can for you i mean that's an ideal situation No, absolutely. And that brings me to like, I don't know, one of the second points I made in my notes for this conversation was to talk about like never making the child choose and collaboration over competition. And so if you establish it on the foundation of truth, the child doesn't automatically feel like I have to choose a side because it's like, okay, I know all sides and what really happened. And ultimately, as long as both sides are still choosing to love me, I'm going to choose to love you in return. But, you know, when it it isn't established, then you might have one parent, the parent who feels bad for whatever might have happened, that's trying to overdo things. So they're like, oh, I'm going to buy you all these gifts for Christmas, or I'm going to do all of this. And then it seems like competition And so then you're feeling like, well, I have to choose which parent I, you know, 
give more time or love or, you know, give the best Christmas gift to when in reality you sit down you have the conversation, both parents choose to collaborate and co-parent. And then the child doesn't even have to experience any of that. That is so cool. And I love that collaboration over competition, but most of the time (laughs) what what I'll see is there's this competition, you know, there's, there's ego going on because, you know, either there's now new partners or the child, depending on certain ages, wants mom more, wants dad more, wants whatever's happening. And it's like, there's that competition going on and the ego. And so it is like, I'm trying to be the better parent. And it's like you said, it's, it's the child. It's not their job to have to feel guilty, to have to make one parent feel better than the other. It's like, you as the adult, as a parent, you're in charge of making yourself feel good. It's not up to your to your child. Absolutely. And especially when you mentioned the part of like them bringing in another partner, it's like, so first it started between my two biological parents and then you start adding step parents into the mix. And yeah. it's like, you know, the one who like, because of course all of them, they didn't remarry at the same time. So the person who had a partner first, they're going to give more expensive gifts because now they can't afford it. Well, then the other one is like, no, I have to keep up. So then maybe they didn't have more expensive gifts, but they had more gifts in terms of quantity. And it was just, it was a lot (laughs) dealing with growing up as a child. (laughs) And you're like, you just say thank you to everyone. And I'm like, oh my gosh. (laughs) So much pressure. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So how... How did it affect you, all of that? How did it affect you in your older years, like becoming an adult? Becoming an adult, it affected me. Well, one, I'm always, I try to put a positive spin on everything. So even I used to try to make it sound cool in middle school and high school when I'm like, oh my gosh, I have four parents. Like, this is so great. And, you know, and I I really tried to put a nice positive spin on it, but it did ultimately affect me in terms of making me feel like I always had to pick one. And, you know, when it came to holidays and especially the older I got Thanksgiving and Christmas, it's like, okay, well, where do you want to go? And I'm like, ah, don't make me pick (laughs) or, you know, your birthday, do, who do you want to celebrate with? Or do you want everyone to be there? And sometimes I'm usually a, I want everyone in the room to be there, all family on all sides, including step parents and family as well. And then sometimes I would realize that would make the room uncomfortable, even though I was comfortable. So then I felt like, okay, well, I have to pick who do I want, where, and, you know, or for special days like Mother's Day, Father's Day, well, who gets the better better Father's Day gift or how much money am I allocating towards each parent? Like it really, it was stressful and it still is at times, but now I've gotten in my adulthood, I've gotten to a point where I'm like, okay, this is where I'm at in the city I'm located in. You all can choose to come here to me. And, you know, and I, it's not to say I don't go visit my parents because I do. And I visit them both on both sides. But at the same time, like this past Christmas, I spent Christmas at my house in Houston and I, I didn't go to my family in Missouri or my family in Oklahoma. I was like, you all can pick to come here or not. And either way, I'm going to enjoy my first Christmas here in Houston. And so that, that kind of gave me that independence when I became older as an adult to say, I don't have to choose anymore. I will go visit them when I do feel, but on special days and occasions, I can choose me and and that's okay. (laughs) I love that so much. And it's really having, it's creating healthy boundaries for yourself. Yeah. So how, how is the relationship now with your parents and do they have any sort of relationship together? It's much better with my parents all all across the board. It's much better, but it took, so for me as an adult, and this is, I guess it's a piggyback off of the previous question. What else I did was I went to counseling and I chose that when I was an adult because I realized I had started dating and just how small things were playing out in my dating relationships. And, you know, if it happens to one person, 
to be aware of that. That's amazing. So <laughs> yeah, well, if I'm a big person on like, okay, if it happens one time, maybe it's just something slight that happens. But if it happens multiple times, or I keep hearing the same comments from different individuals, the problem is me. I'm the common denominator. So I, I took a summer off of dating, off of talking to anyone of the opposite sex or anyone of interest. And I went to counseling and I, I told my therapist, I was like, this is what keeps happening. I believe this is the root problem, you know, help me fix it. And so that particular summer, I wrote letters to different individuals, including my parents. And I wrote letters about how my childhood impacted me, how it's affected my adulthood, how I want to release them and forgive them, because really you're releasing them for yourself, not for them. But, you know, they don't know unless they know. So I wrote letters to them. And I think that really helped to clear the air and the path forward. So both parents, you know, we've had different conversations and that are very transparent that are, that were uncomfortable, but now a year later, it's so much better. And I, I can't even imagine, like, I wish I could have told the childhood younger girl that it was going to get this much better because there were days that it didn't feel like it would. And so that's helped a lot. And so now everyone is good. All sides are fine. And even they, as much as it was hard for them, they were okay with me choosing to stay home for Christmas. Everyone understands each other and they do, they, they do communicate my mom and my father if it's like a, a dire situation. So because I stay in Houston, there might be moments where it's flooding or a hurricane warning. And if I happen to answer neither of their calls, then they'll call each other and they're like, have you heard from her? Why is she not picking up her phone? <laughs> so <laughs> they'll, they'll reach out to each other like on dire situations when it comes to me. But outside of that, after I graduated, it was kind of like, okay, our, our job is done. And all they did was remain in contact with me, but not really in contact with each other. Hey guys, did you know that you can text us now? Like if you want to be the first to know if we're going live or just launched a new episode, or maybe that we just went out on a date or had a fight, who's right, who's wrong. Maybe we ate too much for dinner or missed a workout. No, seriously, we want to share more of what's going on in our lives. And we want to make sure that you don't miss out on anything new. So send a quick hello to 760 389 three, seven, two, two, and let's stay connected. All right. Back to the show. Was there, I don't know if you, you can say this, but did they have arguments growing up? Like, yes, <laughs> that you might've gotten in the middle of. I definitely, I didn't get in the middle of them because they usually didn't do it in front of me, but as a child, you just know And like, even there were certain rooms in the house. I can say this now because I no longer live with my mom, but there were certain rooms in her house where you could hear her bedroom and like, I could hear her like yelling on the phone or something. And so, yeah, I do know that they did get in arguments and it would be over very minor childish things. And oftentimes my mom would go to bat, like if my dad didn't show up for an event or something and she saw me crying after the event, she's like, you know, she's crying because you weren't here and would go off on him. <laughs> so, you know, she's, she's a trooper. She's a great mom and both parents are great, but I do know that there were arguments. Now there aren't. And I think what stopped the arguments was when both parents decided they were going to show up a hundred percent and, yeah. you know, step parents and all. But when both parents decided, okay, I'm going to be here, regardless of the other parent that might be in the audience or who else is in the room, it made everything much better. Yeah. How was your relationship with your step parents? My relationship with my step parents. So with one, it was like, well, no, it affected both of my step parents, actually. So my stepfather, he was the first step parent I had. And for him, I think it took me opening up and allowing him to come in. And he, he's been a great father. He still is to this day. Like, I'm so grateful for him. But when he first came, I think I was just kind of like expecting my dad to be at things, like my biological father. So it was like, you're not my dad. And I get it. He was still there and still at events. But it was almost like that internal attitude of like, 
but you're not that person. Stop trying to fill that role when you're not that person. And it took me growing up and realizing, you know, let him in. If, if he's the one that's choosing that he's going to be here, either way, he, it's someone in my corner, someone who's choosing to be there for me. So let him in. And so once I did that, me and my stepfather have the best relationship <laughs> out of all time. Like I, I'll die for him and I know he'll die for me in a heartbeat. And then my stepmom, it took some growing and, and it's not because she did anything wrong exactly at the forefront. It's just because I'm really close to my mother. And so then in one sense, it was like, I don't want to hurt her if I'm saying happy mother's day to another woman, or, yeah. you know, if, if I'm sending these types of gifts to someone else, like it was, it was more or less like, I felt like I really had to pick between those two. And when it became a, you don't have to pick. And, you know, this is your mother and this is, she calls herself, like we call each other, she's my bonus mom. So it's like, this is your bonus mom and this is your mother. It made things so much easier. But I think in my head, I was like, oh no, like just the title mother, I I wasn't adjusting well to it. And I'm like, I don't, I don't want to hurt my mom's feelings ever because I'm extremely close to her. So... Totally. And I think so that's the thing that so many kids struggle with is that like, oh, I don't want to hurt my mom's feelings to where I think it's more, it's part of the biological parent. You know, if, if there is a relationship to, you know, foster and be like, it's totally fine. You know, you're allowed to love other people and everybody's like, loves you back. So you're yeah. good. <laughs> and my mom, she always did support it. It's just I'm the baby too, to add on top of that. So I'm extremely close with her. And I know yeah. like, you know, that one that always latched on. So I didn't want to make it even worse that me, the baby child is deciding I'm going to let my stepmom in like, yeah. Yeah, totally. Okay. Well, that was my next question was siblings. And were there any bonus siblings that, that came into the family as well or into your life, I should say? <laughs> Yes, there was on one side, on one side, there was, and on one side, there wasn't. And we're great, but I had to (laughs) confirm at first because the bonus sibling was a girl. And so it was actually on my dad's side and I am my dad's only daughter. And so I have been big on like, I'm a daddy's girl. I'm not sharing that spot or anything. So when I found out like one, he was getting married and two, there was a chance of another like girl. I'm like, oh no, like you are not taking my spot, (laughs) but she's older than me. And so I think that helped because I'm like, well, I'm still the baby girl. So, you know, it's fine. (laughs) That's, um, it's so funny. That's so my daughter, our youngest in the family has always been like, do not, you can never have any more babies, which we weren't planning on anyways, but she wanted to be the baby. And yet the two from my husband were just like, you should have another one. Come on, have another one, have another one. Cause they're older. So it's yeah. like fun for them. And she's just like, do not take away because then on their dad's side, they had younger siblings. So it's like, she's like, I need to be the baby in this family. (laughs) Yes. No, I get that. And so, no, but we, we all have a great bond all around all of my siblings. There's, there hasn't been any issues or drama in terms of my siblings. So that's awesome. That's awesome. Cause that can be, that can be a deal. (laughs) Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. And I've heard in several cases where it can be, but I really think Again, it goes back to the things that we addressed previously, having a conversation about truth on all sides and then establishing collaboration, not competition, because then even it can seem like competition between siblings when that's not addressed. It can seem like, oh, well, my stepsister is getting more gifts than I am. Why, Why is that the case? When in reality, maybe it's just because my stepsister lives with my dad and my stepmom and I don't. And so I might think, oh, she's getting more gifts when in reality, I'm probably getting the same thing on my side where I live at. It's just, I'm not there in person to, you know, on where she lives. Point. Yeah. That is, that is a brilliant point because that is such a common, I think we did almost like a whole episode on just that and those feelings that, that kids have. One thing that I wanted to talk about with you was 
the whole idea of, you know, your parents aren't bad people. You say this, parents aren't bad people. They're just broken, right? Like they're coming from these hard situations. And I love this. And I want to hear your take on this, because if there's anything that people in blended families are going through divorce, broken families, kids involved, all this stuff is that they're so much guilt of being a bad parent. There's even kids that grow up saying my parent was bad because of, you know, this one showed up, like you said earlier, you know, your mom showed up to more events than your dad did, you know, does, does that necessarily make him a bad parent? So I love, I just want to hear your, your take on that. And, you know, cause I think so many people listening are just like, oh my gosh, yes, please speak to that because yes. I feel like a bad parent. <laughs> no. And I, I don't like to call people bad people for one in general, but I really do believe that. And I, I had heard a speaker say it in a different twist, but I took it for, this is how my parents are. I, they are not bad people. They're broken people. I mean, most people, when they get together, and especially if I go back probably 20 years, they were young, like they can be between the ages of 18 to 25. And I know now myself being between that age bracket, there's a lot of growing I've done. There's a lot of therapy I've gone to, and I'm still not a hundred percent where I feel like I'm healed and a hundred percent ready for a family. And so being that they got together at that age, as well as being unaware of what their own families carried, they were just broken. And I realized that they realized that. And since going to counseling, like that's been something that's addressed. Uh, and a lot of times it could be, you know, maybe one parent on their side abandoned them or they weren't in the household. Like I know one of my parents grew up without a parent because her or because there was a death. So it's like, you know, not having that parent there. And then another parent, it was that parent just chose not to be there. So already coming from those types of homes, they were expecting each other to fill something that neither of them had the capacity to fill. And then, you know, when that didn't happen and you add a child to the mix, I'm just a product of broken people. And then, and it's not to say I'm broken myself, but at the same time, then being a product from broken people, um, it already positioned me to be broken myself. And so then growing, going to therapy, addressing things has since allowed me to heal to where I can step back and I can see that. And I can see, okay, they weren't bad people that were choosing not to be there for me. They didn't even know how to be there for themselves and what they were going through and, you know, and what they experienced in their upbringing and what they experienced having me. They didn't know how to be there for themselves. They didn't know how to be there for each other as, you know, spouses. And then definitely you adding a child to the mix. They didn't know how to be there for me as parents. I think one of the people who said it best was Jada Pinkett Smith when she talked about her father on the Red Table Talk. And she said, he wasn't created solely to be my father. Like, He was created as an individual for an individual purpose. And, you know, he just so just so happened along his path that he became her father. And, you know, but was there a manual with that? Did he know how to do that? Was that what he was created for? No. (laughs) And so when I look at that and I apply it to my own parents, it's like they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know what they were carrying. They didn't know what several call generational curses or, you know, cycles that were on both sides of their families, they didn't know how it affected them. And so then as a result, they didn't know how it affected me and how it impacted them raising me. So yeah, I I say I'm not a product of bad people, just broken people. But, you know, as long as we're still living, we have products or we have the opportunity to become whole. So absolutely. Learning and it just so happens you learn, you know, just because we come par- become parents doesn't mean we have it all figured out. Like you said, I remember, I, I must have been like seven or eight years old. And I remember, I remember this conversation so well. And my dad saying, you know, something about, you know, we, we had a life before you were born. It wasn't the exact words that he said, but I was just like, wait, what? Like <laughs> he kind of said the same thing. Like we didn't just come on this planet and then boom you're our child. Like, yeah, I was a kid before I was a teenager. I, you know, all it had first jobs, all these things. And I remember just being like, 
oh yeah, I guess that's right. Like it just totally <laughs> hit me in this new way. And it's, it's funny. Cause I even, you know, recently my husband was sharing a conversation he had with his daughter where he's just like, you know, the same way that you have dreams and goals and things that you're working towards, I have those same things. And so, you know, there's, these are the things that I, I'm, you know, I get really passionate about, or these are the things that, you know, really get me excited, just like you have your things. And I think it's, it's funny when you hear, because you do think that your sole purpose of being born was for me, you know, and some people say that this is my whole purpose, which is awesome. But like, there's other things. (laughs) Exactly. No, yeah. that is so true. And then when you don't realize that as a child, and especially that parent who lived nine hours away, I'm like, so why is he not here to love me? Like, that's what you were created for was to be here every single day when I needed you pick me up from school as have a tea party with my stuffed animals. Like, duh, where are you? <laughs> but now like being an adult and being older, I'm like, okay, bills, they got to get paid somehow. Like, (laughs) exactly, exactly. It's so funny. Yeah. That's just, it's the hard part. It's also the beautiful part of just evolving through life. You know, some of those things don't make sense and they, they feel hard at those times as a kid and as a parent. And then as you evolve and as you learn, you realize, oh, okay, there's some logic behind that. Maybe I just need a different perspective. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. No, that is so true. And That is where like, there are moments where I'm like, okay, maybe if someone told me this younger, I would have understood it. Now it doesn't say that it would have made it easier because there were events where I, like I said, I grew up in a military town. So the biggest thing for me, I often saw all the time, the parent surprises of coming to pick up their kids from school. And usually it was more men than women. So it was like, you know, dad just came back from Iraq or Iran and, you know, and the kids are running to them. And I'm like, when is my dad ever going to come pick me up from school? And it usually didn't happen because dad lives nine hours away. He could make it by the time he got to town, like, let's say he's coming for the weekend. Well, it was after I got out of school because he had been driving all day. But in my head, I didn't piece that together. I'm just like, well, why isn't he here? And, you know, and everyone else is getting that and I'm not. And so that was always something that was hard for me then to understand. But now as an adult, it makes so much more sense. So if it would have been explained to me, then I don't even know if it would have changed how I felt just because of what I saw on a daily basis. But growing older, now I can look back and understand. Yeah. I love this. This episode is really for, for parents and for kids and adult kids of, of divorce. So good. You've dropped so many gems. <laughs> I love oh, it so much. <laughs> I hope I have. And I think the biggest thing is just understanding, having those conversations and realizing it's not easy, but once you have them, it's going to make things much better. Because I think people walk around on eggshells their entire lives. Then they walk around not having those conversations with their parents or not knowing how to, and then they come out in the wrong way. So probably when I was in my middle school stages, that's when I was like talking back more and really sassy. And my relationship with my dad was not good. Like I would scream at him if he was not at my birthday party or something at a certain time, like, because that's how mad and angry and frustrated I got when really was my issue that he didn't show up for one event or was it that he wasn't in my life on a day-to-day basis? And maybe that I needed to sit down and have that conversation and understand why he wasn't there on a day-to-day basis that might've made things better, but it's like, you, you don't know how to, you don't know how to express it. And so I really think one, I'm a huge advocate for therapy. If people can afford it. And usually there are even free ways to get therapy nowadays. So too, which I I've known. Yeah. I've actually known like some teens that are using them and having great success. So yes, there are very affordable ways to, to get therapy. Yes. I a hundred percent support that Two, I would just say parents as well as kids learn to listen, like be slow to speak and quick to listen. And I think, you know, it's worth 
that child and that parent on each side sitting down and having a conversation. And that's without the step parents in the room, because sometimes that made it harder too, was when I wanted to have the conversation, the step parent was in the room and they went to Finn for them or go to be like, oh, but this, your parent is a great person. Like, don't put them down like that. And that goes to invalidate your feelings. Like, no, sit down, have the conversation with parent and child and that parent listen to how the child is feeling. And then child listen to the reality of what the parent goes through. Will it a hundred percent make you feel better on the end as a child? No, but it will bring some clarity to the situation. Like the moments when my mom was with my stepdad, my dad, he is a single parent. So of course, he finances, it just automatically wasn't the same. And then, you know, you add in a nine hour drive for him versus me staying with my mom and stepdad. It already pitted it against him that, you know, he was so much farther away. And then I have mom and stepdad doing way more for me than he was, where it's like, maybe a reality check could have been, okay, listen, (laughs) There's only one income coming in for dad. Mom and stepdad have two incomes coming in, you know, which means that it's a little bit more affordable for them to take you to cool places throughout the year. But as dad, I do still want to be in your life. And maybe if we can't do something as cool and crazy and spectacular, guess what? Baking a cake, learning how to change a tire. It's just as important as going to the national park or going to Disneyland. And, you know, in my adulthood, those are the things that I needed to know more. I mean, yes, going to museums and parks were fun, but I needed to know more how to change a tire. I needed to know more, you know, how to do things around my house. So I don't know. I, I think it's worth the parent and the child on both sides, listening to each other, having those transparent conversations, getting through that uncomfortable moment and realizing as long as there's still time left on this earth for all of us, there's time to grow and heal. Yeah, I agree 100%. Uh, and those conversations, you know, whether you have one weekend a month or it's every other weekend or once, you know, whatever that time frame is, having those conversations just, I, you know, as a child makes you, it kind of rejuvenates you because you, you feel important. You feel like it's it's a meaningful. You're being heard, you know, and that's like the most important thing. And I totally, a thousand percent, agree. Don't have the step parent there because no, you're not going to be the child. Especially, is not going to be as it's not going to connect the same because it's awkward. And no matter how much you might love your step parent, it's like it's got to be between the child and the parent and the bio parent. I totally agree. Cause I've seen that happen. And then there's all this pressure and it's like, I don't think you're going to accomplish what you want to accomplish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's so true. And then even with like how I told you all after I found out the reason behind my parents divorce, and it took me two years to address that with both parents. Well, the reason why it took me two years to address it with my father was because there was never a chance to talk to him without that other person in the room. And I didn't want to be like, hey, this is what you did wrong. I heard about it through so-and-so and and they're sitting in the room. And (laughs) yeah, that's, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, like it's just, it's awkward. Or even saying that to them and the other person in the room being like, no, he didn't do that. Like he would never do something like that. And then I'm like, well, it, it just, it makes you as a child, it invalidates your feelings. So validate their feelings and just talk to them one-on-one. Where can people find more information about you, find your podcast, all of those, those good things that I know that they're probably dying to find out. Yes. So you can follow me on Facebook at J Camille and that's J dot Camille, C-A-M-I-L-L-E. And then on Instagram, it's the dot shift podcast. So I'm on Facebook and I'm also on Instagram and I'm on TikTok too. I recently started a TikTok, so I can't tell you my name right off the bat, but if you follow me on Instagram, you will see my TikTok because I post (laughs) it. I'm excited to see 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 it. I
<laughs> I'm a newbie too. I have my daughter helping me out doing it's, it's actually fun and it becomes addicting. That's all I can say. <laughs> it's very addicting, but I usually post like a one minute segment a week of just like a positive message. I'm Christian and spiritual, so it might have something to do around that, but I just try to post a positive message a week because that's just who I am. I try to find a positive spin in everything. So yeah, follow the shift podcast. This was my biggest shift. My first shift in life ever was dealing with my parents' divorce. But since then, it's helped me to shift in every way, in every area of my life. You're an incredible example. I'm so grateful that you joined me today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Summer, for having me. And I really hope that this helps someone. Thank you so much for listening. And we like to say, if you enjoyed this episode, share it with someone you love and be bold enough to share it with someone you don't. See you next time.